Welcome back to Law Requisites PH where we discuss relevant Philippine laws and regulations to help inform Filipinos about their basic rights. Know your rights as it might one day save your life. In the last videos, we talked about Rule 1 to 31. Today, we will talk about the revised civil procedure starting from Rule 32 to Rule 38. Want to receive updates from us? Subscribe now. Rule 32. Trial by Commissioner. Section 1. Reference by Consent. By written consent of both parties, the court may order any or all of the issues in a case to be referred to a commissioner to be agreed upon by the parties or to be appointed by the court. As used in these rules, the word commissioner includes a referee, an auditor and an examiner. 1. Section 2. Reference ordered on motion. When the parties do not consent, the court may, upon the application of either or of its own motion, direct a reference to a commissioner in the following cases, a. When the trial of an issue of fact requires the examination of a long account on either side, in which case the commissioner may be directed to hear and report upon the whole issue or any specific question involved therein. b. When the taking of an account is necessary for the information of the court before judgment, or for carrying a judgment or order into effect. c. When a question of fact, other than upon the pleadings, arises upon motion or otherwise, in any stage of a case, or for carrying a judgment or order into effect. 2. Section 3. Order of Reference. Powers of the Commissioner. When a reference is made, the clerk shall forthwith furnish the commissioner with a copy of the order of reference. The order may specify or limit the powers of the commissioner, and may direct him or her to report only upon particular issues, or to do or perform particular acts, or to receive and report evidence only, and may fix the date for beginning and closing the hearings and for the filing of his or her report. Subject to the specifications and limitations stated in the order, the commissioner has and shall exercise the power to regulate the proceedings in every hearing before him or her and to do all acts and take all measures necessary or proper for the efficient performance of his or her duties under the order. He or she may issue subpoenas and subpoenas deuces take them, swear witnesses, and unless otherwise provided in the order of reference, he or she may rule upon the admissibility of evidence. The trial or hearing before him or her shall proceed in all respects as it would if held before the court. 3a. Section 4. Oath of Commissioner. Before entering upon his or her duties the Commissioner shall be sworn to a faithful and honest performance thereof. 4a. Section 5. Proceedings before Commissioner. Upon receipt of the order of reference and unless otherwise provided therein, the Commissioner shall forthwith set a time and place for the first meeting of the parties or their counsel to be held within 1010 calendar days after the date of the order of reference and shall notify the parties or their counsel. 5a, Section 6. Failure of Parties to Appear Before Commissioner. If a party fails to appear at the time and place appointed, the Commissioner may proceed ex part or, in his or her discretion, adjourn the proceedings to a future day, giving notice to the absent party or his or her counsel of the adjournment. 6a. Section 7. Refusal of Witness. The refusal of a witness to obey a subpoena issued by the Commissioner or to give evidence before him or her, shall be deemed a contempt of the court which appointed the Commissioner. 7a. Section 8. Commissioner shall avoid delays. It is the duty of the Commissioner to proceed with all reasonable diligence. Either party, on notice to the parties and Commissioner, may apply to the court for an order requiring the Commissioner to expedite the proceedings and to make his or her report. 8a. Section 9. Report of Commissioner. Upon the completion of the trial or hearing or proceeding before the Commissioner, he or she shall file with the court his or her report in writing upon the matter submitted to him or her by the order of reference. When his or her powers are not specified or limited, he or she shall set forth his or her findings of fact and conclusions of law in his or her report. He or she shall attach there to all exhibits, affidavits, depositions, papers and the transcript, if any, of the testimonial evidence presented before him or her. 
9a, Section 10. Notice to parties of the filing of report. Upon the filing of the report, the parties shall be notified by the clerk, and they shall be allowed 1010 calendar days within which to signify grounds of objections to the findings of the report, if they so desire. Objections to the report based upon grounds which were available to the parties during the proceedings before the Commissioner, other than objections to the findings and conclusions therein set forth, shall not be considered by the Court unless they were made before the Commissioner. 10a, Section 11. Hearing upon report. Upon the expiration of the period of 1010, calendar days referred to in the preceding section, the report shall be set for hearing, after which the court shall issue an order adopting, modifying, or rejecting the report in whole or in part, or recommitting it with instructions, or requiring the parties to present further evidence before the commissioner or the court. 11a, Section 12. Stipulations as to findings. When the parties stipulate that a commissioner findings of fact shall be final, only questions of law shall thereafter be considered. 12. Section 13. Compensation of Commissioner. The court shall allow the commissioner such reasonable compensation as the circumstances of the case warrant, to be taxed as costs against the defeated party, or a portion, as justice requires. 13. Rule 33 Demur to Evidence Section 1. Demurrer to Evidence After the plaintiff has completed the presentation of his or her evidence, the defendant may move for dismissal on the ground that upon the facts and the law the plaintiff has shown no right to relief. If his or her motion is denied, he or she shall have the right to present evidence. If the motion is granted but on appeal the order of dismissal is reversed, he or she shall be deemed to have waived the right to present evidence. 1a. Section 2. Action on demur to evidence. A demur to evidence shall be subject to the provisions of Rule 15. The order denying the demur to evidence shall not be subject of an appeal or petition for certiorari, prohibition or mandamus before judgment. N. Rule 34 Judgment on the Pleadings Section 1. Judgment on the pleadings where an answer fails to tender an issue, or otherwise admits the material allegations of the adverse party pleading, the court may, on motion of that party, direct judgment on such pleading. However, in actions for declaration of nullity or annulment of marriage or for legal separation, the material facts alleged in the complaint shall always be proved. 1. Section 2. Action on motion for judgment on the pleadings. The court may motu proprio or on motion render judgment on the pleadings if it is apparent that the answer fails to tender an issue, or otherwise admits the material allegations of the adverse party pleadings. Otherwise, the motion shall be subject to the provisions of Rule 15 of these rules. Any action of the court on a motion for judgment on the pleadings shall not be subject of an appeal or petition for certiorari, prohibition or mandamus. N. Rule 35 Summary Judgment Section 1. Summary Judgment for Claimant. A party seeking to recover upon a claim, counterclaim, or cross-claim or to obtain a declaratory relief may, at any time after the pleading and answer thereto has been served, move with supporting affidavits, depositions or admissions for a summary judgment in his or her favor upon all or any part thereof. 1a. Rules 35-36 Section 2. Summary Judgment for Defending Party. A party against whom a claim, counterclaim, or cross-claim is asserted or a declaratory relief is sought may, at any time, move with supporting affidavits, depositions or admissions for a summary judgment in his or her favor as to all or any part thereof. 2a. Section 3. Motion and Proceedings Thereon. The motion shall cite the supporting affidavits, depositions or admissions, and the specific law relied upon. The adverse party may file a comment and serve opposing affidavits, depositions, or admissions within a non-extendable period of 5-5 calendar days from receipt of the motion. Unless the court orders the conduct of a hearing, judgment sought shall be rendered forthwith if the pleadings, supporting affidavits, depositions and admissions on file, show that, except as to the amount of damages, 
there is no genuine issue as to any material fact and that the moving party is entitled to judgment as a matter of law. Any action of the court on a motion for summary judgment shall not be subject of an appeal or petition for certiorari, prohibition or mandamus. 3A, Section 4. Case not fully adjudicated on motion. If on motion under this rule, judgment is not rendered upon the whole case or for all the relief sought and a trial is necessary, the court may, by examining the pleadings and the evidence before it and by interrogating counsel, ascertain what material facts exist without substantial controversy, including the extent to which the amount of damages or other relief is not in controversy, and direct such further proceedings in the action as are just. The facts so ascertained shall be deemed established, and the trial shall be conducted on the controverted facts accordingly. 4a, Section 5. Form of Affidavits and Supporting Papers. Supporting and opposing affidavits shall be made on personal knowledge, shall set forth such facts as would be admissible in evidence, and shall show affirmatively that the affiant is competent to testify to the matters stated therein. Certified true copies of all papers or parts thereof referred to in the affidavit shall be attached thereto or served therewith. 5. Section 6. Affidavits in bad faith. Should it appear to its satisfaction at any time that any of the affidavits presented pursuant to this rule are presented in bad faith, or solely for the purpose of delay, the court shall forthwith order the offending party or counsel to pay to the other party the amount of the reasonable expenses which the filing of the affidavits caused him or her to incur, including attorney fees. I. T. May, after hearing, further adjudge the offending party or counsel guilty of contempt. 6a. Rule 36 Judgments, Final Orders and Entry thereof Section 1. Rendition of Judgments and Final Orders. A judgment or final order determining the merits of the case shall be in writing personally and directly prepared by the judge, stating clearly and distinctly the facts and the law on which it is based, signed by him, and filed with the clerk of the court. 1a. Section 2. Entry of Judgments and Final Orders. If no appeal or motion for new trial or reconsideration is filed within the time provided in these rules, the judgment or final order shall forthwith be entered by the clerk in the book of entries of judgments. The date of finality of the judgment or final order shall be deemed to be the date of its entry. The record shall contain the dispositive part of the judgment or final order and shall be signed by the clerk, with a certificate that such judgment or final order has become final and executory. 2A, 10, R51, Section 3. Judgment for or against one or more of several parties. Judgment may be given for or against one or more of several plaintiffs, and for or against one or more of several defendants. When justice so demands, the court may require the parties on each side to file adversary pleadings as between themselves and determine their ultimate rights and obligations. 3. Section 4. Several Judgments. In an action against several defendants, the court may, when a several judgment is proper, render judgment against one or more of them, leaving the action to proceed against the others. 4. Section 5. Separate judgments. When more than one claim for relief is presented in an action, the court, at any stage, upon a determination of the issues material to a particular claim and all counterclaims arising out of the transaction or occurrence which is the subject matter of the claim, may render a separate judgment disposing of such claim. The judgment shall terminate the action with respect to the claim so disposed of and the action shall proceed as to the remaining claims. In case a separate judgment is rendered, the court by order may stay its enforcement until the rendition of a subsequent judgment or judgments and may prescribe such conditions as may be necessary to secure the benefit thereof to the party in whose favor the judgment is rendered. 5a, Section 6. Judgment against entity without juridical personality. When judgment is rendered against two or more persons sued as an entity without juridical personality, the judgment shall set out their individual or proper names, if known. 6a, Rule 37 New Trial or Reconsideration Section 1. Grounds of and period for filing motion for new trial or reconsideration. 
within the period for taking an appeal, the aggrieved party may move the trial court to set aside the judgment or final order and grant a new trial for one or more of the following causes materially affecting the substantial rights of said party, a. Fraud, accident, mistake or excusable negligence which ordinary prudence could not have guarded against and by reason of which such a grieved party has probably been impaired in his rights. Or b. Newly discovered evidence, which he could not, with reasonable diligence, have discovered and produced at the trial, and which if presented would probably alter the result. Within the same period, the aggrieved party may also move for reconsideration upon the grounds that the damages awarded are excessive, that the evidence is insufficient to justify the decision or final order, or that the decision or final order is contrary to law. 1a. Section 2. Contents of motion for new trial or reconsideration and notice thereof. The motion shall be made in writing stating the ground or grounds therefore, a written notice of which shall be served by the movement on the adverse party. A motion for new trial shall be proved in the manner provided for proof of motions. A motion for the cause mentioned in paragraph A, of the preceding section shall be supported by affidavits of merits which may be rebutted by affidavits. A motion for the cause mentioned in paragraph B, shall be supported by affidavits of the witnesses by whom such evidence is expected to be given, or by duly authenticated documents which are proposed to be introduced in evidence. A motion for reconsideration shall point out specifically the findings or conclusions of a judgment or final order which are not supported by the evidence or which are contrary to law, making express reference to the testimonial or documentary evidence or to the provisions of law alleged to be contrary to such findings or conclusions. A pro forma motion for new trial or reconsideration shall not hold the regulatory period of appeal. 2a. Section 3. Action upon motion for new trial or reconsideration. The trial court may set aside the judgment or final order and grant a new trial, upon such terms as may be just, or may deny the motion. If the court finds that excessive damages have been awarded or that the judgment or final order is contrary to the evidence or law, it may amend such judgment or final order accordingly. 3a, R37, Section 4. Resolution of Motion A motion for new trial or reconsideration shall be resolved within 30, 30 days from the time it is submitted for resolution. N. Section 5 Second Motion for New Trial A motion for new trial shall include all grounds then available and those not so included shall be deemed waived. A second motion for new trial, based on a ground not existing nor available when the first motion was made may be filed within the time herein provided excluding the time during which the first motion had been pending. No party shall be allowed a second motion for reconsideration of a judgment or final order. 4a, R37. 4, IRG Section 6. Effect of Granting of Motion for New Trial. If a new trial is granted in accordance with the provisions of this rule, the original judgment or final order shall be vacated and the action shall stand for trial de novo. But the recorded evidence taken upon the former trial, insofar as the same is material and competent to establish the issues, shall be used at the new trial without retaking the same. 5a, Section 7. Partial New Trial or Reconsideration. If the grounds for a motion under this rule appear to the court to affect the issues as to only a part, or less than all of the matter in controversy, or only one, or less than all, of the parties to it, the court may order a new trial or grant reconsideration as to such issues if severable without interfering with the judgment or final order upon the rest. 6a, Section 8. Effect of Order for Partial New Trial. When less than all of the issues are ordered retried, the court may either enter a judgment or final order as to the rest, or stay the enforcement of such judgment or final order until after the new trial. 7a, Section 9. Remedy against order denying a motion for new trial or reconsideration. An order denying a motion for new trial or reconsideration is not appealable, the remedy being an appeal from the judgment or final order. N. Rule 38 Relief from Judgments, Orders, 
or other proceedings section 1. Petition for relief from judgment, order, or other proceedings. When a judgment or final order is entered, or any other proceeding is thereafter taken against a party in any court through fraud, accident, mistake, or excusable negligence, he may file a petition in such court and in the same case praying that the judgment, order or proceeding be set aside. 2a. Section 2. Petition for relief from denial of appeal. When a judgment or final order is rendered by any court in a case, and a party thereto, by fraud, accident, mistake, or excusable negligence, has been prevented from taking an appeal, he may file a petition in such court and in the same case praying that the appeal be given due course. 1a. Section 3. Time for Filing Petition. Contents and Verification. A petition provided for in either of the preceding sections of this rule must be verified, filed within 6060 days after the petitioner learns of a judgment, final order, or other proceeding to be set aside, and not more than 66 months after such judgment or final order was entered, or such proceeding was taken, and must be accompanied with affidavits showing the fraud, accident, mistake, or excusable negligence relied upon, and the facts constituting the petitioner good and substantial cause of action or defense, as the case may be. 3. Section 4. Order to file an answer. If the petition is sufficient in form and substance to justify relief, the court in which it is filed, shall issue an order requiring the adverse parties to answer the same within 1515, days from the receipt thereof. The order shall be served in such manner as the court may direct, together with copies of the petition and the accompanying affidavits. 4a. Section 5. Preliminary Injunction Pending Proceedings The court in which the petition is filed, may grant such preliminary injunction as may be necessary for the preservation of the rights of the parties, upon the filing by the petitioner of a bond in favor of the adverse party, conditioned that if the petition is dismissed or the petitioner fails on the trial of the case upon its merits, he will pay the adverse party all damages and costs that may be awarded to him by reason of the issuance of such injunction or the other proceedings following the petition. But such injunction shall not operate to discharge or extinguish any lien which the adverse party may have acquired upon the property of the petitioner. 5a. Section 6. Proceedings after answer is filed. After the filing of the answer or the expiration of the period therefore, the court shall hear the petition and if after such hearing, it finds that the allegations thereof are not true, the petition shall be dismissed. But if it finds said allegations to be true, it shall set aside the judgment or final order or other proceeding complained of upon such terms as may be just. Thereafter the case shall stand as if such judgment, final order or other proceeding had never been rendered, issued or taken. The court shall then proceed to hear and determine the case as if a timely motion for a new trial or reconsideration had been granted by it. 6a. Section 7. Procedure where the denial of an appeal is set aside. Where the denial of an appeal is set aside, the lower court shall be required to give due course to the appeal and to elevate the record of the appealed case as if a timely and proper appeal had been made. 7a. End of segment. Like, share and subscribe to this YouTube channel Welcome to continue back to watching this content PH where we discuss relevant Philippine laws and regulations Thank to help you. inform Philippines about time. their basic End rights. Of segment.